Support for NorCal News Now comes from David Green, your Chico Edward Jones Financial Advisor at 2101 Forest Avenue, Suite 120. Additional information is available at edwardjones.com. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Member SIPC. And from viewers like you. But not really, because we haven't asked for donations from viewers yet, so this one's all credited to David. Thanks, David. On this episode of NorCal News Now, we're coming to you from downtown Chico and bringing you our 2020 Butte County Board of Supervisors Candidate Forum, which we recorded earlier in the week. I'm your host, Mike Richmond. I'm the contributor in chief, Aaron Haar. Contributor in chief. That's right. That's your title for the day. I gave it to myself. I well, like Aaron, we're back. All right. We're back, man. We're back after hiatus. It's it's uh, it's primary season. A lot going on. Like I say, we did a, a forum the other day, which we're gonna intro here in a few minutes yeah, but really great for him a lot going on absolutely yeah this, this is uh, this is the time man this is the season we're finally in 2020 yeah, yeah. and it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy yes lots of local elections the mm -hmm. national election heating up uh ever so right so so how are you feeling i'm feeling good i'm yeah. feeling good i'm excited we got some really great stuff coming up we got some some interesting guests potentially and people that have talked to us about wanting to come on the show so yes we'll, bring that to the people yes, here. California the uh, being on the ballot uh, in March 3rd, moving it up. So we'll be having candidates rolling through here yep. and uh, hopefully you'll come to beautiful downtown Chico and, and meet us and join us or or we'll get them on Skype. We'll catch them. Yeah. Uh, we'll catch them where they are and hopefully we'll bring you some great interviews with them. And you know, you mentioned that that's a really good point. I mean, March 3rd is our primary. This is the first time in my memory. I mean, we were June. California has been June all yeah. the time that yeah. I know of, which was really Kind of California never really had a chance to really have much of an impact in these primaries before now. Well, it was. It was a huge voice and right, when California end, spoke, so, yeah. but it was c too little, too late a lot right, of times. Right. And you know, with the voice we have, we should be a bigger part of the discussion. Super so, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Make, make Super Tuesday super. -er. However, it has been a challenge. I mean, even late last year, November, December, people said, "Get ready for 2020." And man, it it has been very difficult and challenging for for everyone from from fundraising to to billboards, to different things, it, it has been a challenge. I think a lot of lessons have been learned on the mm -hmm. campaign trail mm -hmm. to get ready for March. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, nationally, like you say, but locally too. I mean, a lot of the ideas that people have to kind of gear up and be ready earlier yeah. than they were in the past has changed, and we, we're going to see it here in the supervisor forum. Uh, you know, people talking about you know getting people out, mobilizing, yeah. getting their message out, but also the fact that here in Butte County, it's uh, a mail-in. You know, that's a big change too. <clears throat> That uh, is a change I don't like. I think it's a further, you know, I think it really subverts the vote, uh, not only for college students, uh, but people that, you know, don't have a residence at all. You know, very hard for them to get a ballot and vote. Um, and then the, the, the mail-in. I mean, people traditionally like to go to the ballot box, right. some people, and like to cast their ballot. And to go put your ballot in a mail drop box somewhere is, is very foreign to some people. And uh, I don't care, don't know if I quite like it. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm sure the clerk's office is happy about it, though, because yeah. a lot less work for them, I think. Yeah, I, I think so. Save some money, Save right? Save some money, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, also this idea that, you know, given the, the, the structure of our primaries uh, here in California, that really this is going to be the decision. This, this Mar March primary really is going to be the decision, like, say, for the supervisor races. Yes. In all likelihood, we're not going to have a race for the supervisor no, no, in, in November. It's going to be decided yes. in March. Yes. Um, so, because you just need 50%, it's 50% over the line, and that's the winner. Yes. Um, and we have two candidates running in those three mm -hmm. in those three uh, races, so it's going to probably be a winner. Yeah, uh, Sue Hildebrand running against Todd Kemmel Shoe in and, four, and it's really interesting because Sue's running more of a campaign like Deborah Lucero did when mm -hmm. she when she beat uh, a Titan Larry Wall, mm -hmm. and we well, what I named. Uh, Deborah versus Goliath. <laughs> uh, you see Sue running a similar campaign, but but Larry had a record you could run against, and uh, now you see a, a candidate, uh, Todd Kimmel Shoe, who's who's pretty networked in, 
and doesn't really quite have a record to run against. But but Sue out there with a well, great. That's a, a pro and a con too. It course. is. It is. Yeah. So we'll see March third on on letting voters decide uh, uh, what they think. But um, Sue's campaign has been one of the most hardworking campaigns I've seen in, in Butte County in a long time. Yeah. From uh, working down in Gridley, uh, working down in, in other areas, and, and really unincorporated areas that don't get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Henry Schlager and Doug Teeter, the incumbent in five, and of course Bill Connolly and Ian Joseph Green in one mm -hmm. are the races that are that are up. Uh, and before we turn to that forum, I just want to kind of ask you for your sense on some of the national stuff. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. a lot of our audience is interested in that too, of course. I mean, we we went through impeachment now. It's you know Trump was acquitted, uh, you know pretty much party lines other than Mr. Romney in, mm -hmm. in Utah. So the question really is now where do we go from here? I mean as we go into this primary season, as we we find a Democratic candidate, maybe potentially a third party candidate that's going to step up to challenge Trump too. Mm -hmm. You know how do do the people that don't want Trump to be the president? You know who do they rally behind? I mean, Bernie obviously looks like the leader right now. Uh, in, in, the, in the primary on the Democratic side, but is there going to be a, a, an anti, a, a stop Bernie movement the way there was a stop Trump movement? Oh, it's, it's been in the works but, for a long time. But, but yeah. Trump, Trump overcame that. Trump overcame that in 2016 yes, because the people wanted Trump on that side of, of the, the primary. So the people seem to want Bernie. Is he going to triumph like Trump did in 2016? Yes. I, I think a lot of those people were people in manufacturing sectors and town and gown uh, uh, areas um, and in the in some of those uh, beltways that ha that have voters that have been disenfranchised for years, especially with the Democratic Party and not feeling like they have the the back. We've been feeling it uh, from a from a union standpoint. We've been feeling it for for a year or two now with all the strikes, with all the the nursing strikes, the teacher strikes, uh, that there is a movement abreast of of workers and so. Uh, the Democratic Party had meetings before Bernie even announced of how we're going to stop him, and, and, and Buttigieg was part of those meetings, uh, frankly. And then you see some of the some of the inconsistencies in Iowa and the caucuses. We might we seeing apps bought in Nevada. We seeing uh, every heavy heavy hitter from uh, Obama to Carville to to Hillary coming out, um, and then the other side blaming Bernie supporters who he has no control of of of, of causing issues in the race. Um, but I think what you're going to start seeing step by now that Biden has has completely failed out for for that side and and is looking as possibly he might have to drop out. Mm. Um, now you're seeing the rise of Bloomberg and, and well, for a, a brief minute, Deval Patrick from Bain Capital. Good, good guy. Uh, I, I like and, I like Deval Patrick. And so yeah. and so you see these candidates rise and fall against him. And, and with the Bloomberg, now we're really setting it up. Now we're really setting it up to uh, which side are you on? Are we going to let uh, the billionaires uh, buy an election? Mm -hmm. And some people think that that's a good idea, that it takes money to win the race mm -hmm. and that, that that's what's going to be needed. And other people think that that's a bridge too far for them to vote and that they want to see somebody that's uh, going to have the mindset that's going to be there for the people and, and really create a, and transform change here in this country. And, uh, so it's going to be an interesting race uh, coming up. I, I will I will make a prediction. I've made the prediction to you and to and to Chris as well that that I think there's going to be a, a third party, a major third party candidate this year that's going to siphon off a lot of votes. And uh, I don't know how that's going to work out for for the Democrats. But I, I you think could that, see Bloomberg uh, yeah. not make it and run as a third yeah. party. And I think some of the fear within the Democratic Party is what Bernie does in Vermont. They have a special rule in Vermont, so where he gets the nomination, he can then withdraw the nomination and, and run as an independent right. with no competition from the Democrats. There might be some fear in the Democratic establishment that maybe Bernie gets the nomination and, and declines it. Mm. And, and what, a crazy, what a crazy thing that Ooh. would be. If you know Bernie, you know there's a history of the Democratic Party that a lot of us don't, don't like. And we know those years. Uh, the party's changed. He's sworn to be loyal to that party. He has caucused with that party for a long time. So. I don't think there's any any fear in that, and uh, all candidates say they will support the nominee no matter what, yep. and and we'll see. It's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting political science uh, coming forward this year. Good stuff. Well, we're going to be paying attention to it. We'll be here uh, at NorCal News now for the next uh, couple of weeks and months, bringing you shows back off hiatus. So we're starting today again with a forum that we did uh, just the other day uh, here in Chico. 
uh, at Congregation Beth Israel. We had uh, three of the candidates, which we mentioned earlier uh, here in our intro. We had uh, Doug Teeter, who's the incumbent in, in District 5, as well as Henry Schleiger in District 5. Uh, they had a, a, a little session where they were one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then we had Sue Hildebrand uh, in District 4 uh, individually. So let's start with bringing you the, uh, the forum that we had with Doug and Henry uh, here at Congregation Beth Israel the other day. So let's go to that now. Good evening and welcome to the Butte County Board of Supervisors Candidate Forum for the 2020 election cycle. I'm Mike Richmond, host of the NorCal News Now web TV show and your moderator for tonight's event. Well, we're coming to you from Congregation Beth Israel in Chico, which has graciously opened their doors to this event on behalf of the broader Butte County community. So thank you, CBI, for doing that. And to begin, I'd like to ask CBI's spiritual leader, Reb Lisa Rappaport, to come up and offer us a few words. Reb Lisa. Thank you, Mike. As Mike mentioned, my name is Reb Lisa Rappaport. I'm the spiritual leader of Congregation Beth Israel. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight for this important community event. Thank you to the candidates who have come out and are willing to share your thoughts and your opinions and your platforms with us. Thank you to everyone in the community who has come out tonight to listen. And what I wanted to share to begin is that it's really important when we gather together in community, in live time, to engage and to learn with each other. There is a famous quote that I wanted to share that I think will frame our evening. A question is posed, who is wise? And the answer is, the one who is wise is the one who is willing to learn from all people. So with that in mind, I invite and encourage all of us to listen deeply to everything that is brought forward tonight with both an open mind and an open heart. And for those of us who have questions for the candidates, to ask them from a place of curiosity and respect and for all of us who are receiving the answers to listen deeply to what is shared. So with that, let's kick this off and in the spirit of learning together in community for the service of strengthening our community, I want to thank everybody again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Reb Lisa. Well, tonight we're joined by three of the six candidates running for positions on the next Butte County Board of Supervisors. Uh, incumbent Doug Teeter and Henry Schleiger in District 5, and Sue Hildebrand in District 4. Um, Todd's, uh, Todd Kimmelshue, who is Sue's opponent in District 4, had a scheduling conflict tonight. Similarly, incumbent Bill Connolly and Ian Joseph Green running in District 1 could not be here with us. Well, we're going to kick things off here in a moment with a 60-second, I'm sorry, 60-minute session featuring Doug and Henry, during which, following opening statements, I'm going to be posing questions to them about District 5 in particular and Butte County more generally. They'll each have two minutes to answer those questions in alternating order. We'll then take some questions from the audience. You all should have, or you have access to, if you'd like, um, clipboards with questionnaires on them, so you can fill in your question, and we'll We'll get them from you and bring them up here, or you can text me, uh, and you can text me the numbers on the forms, 530-864-2540, with your questions as well. Um, so we'll then take questions from the audience, as I mentioned, uh, and then at the conclusion of the hour, Doug and Henry will each have a closing statement to make. Uh, following that, we're going to have uh, five minutes with Sue. Sue will have a five-minute opening statement, followed by, again, your questions uh, to her uh, directly. So I'd like to ask our audience, in the spirit of fairness, if we all could, to please hold the applause until the end of each se segment. Uh, I think that's probably the most fair way to do this. Okay, so with that, I'd like to uh, get started and invite Doug Teeter and Henry Schleier to come on up and take your seats. Gentlemen. Well, we flipped the coin before this event started, and uh, Doug, you won, so you have the opportunity to give your opening statement, the opening opening statement of the night tonight. So go ahead, two minutes, and you'll hear a chime, by the way, when we're at the end of your time. So All go right, right ahead and stop. <laughs> and so uh, again, ahead. I'm Doug Teeter. Thank you for this forum and uh, the place to hold the forum in. Appreciate that very much. Uh, I've been the uh, District 5 supervisor um, into my eighth year. And I uh, never thought politics would be in my future, but uh, I got mad at the Forest Service long ago and uh, ended up running for county supervisor. I grew up in Paradise, graduated Paradise High, uh, finished college at San Diego State, and I have a degree, uh, science, a bachelor's of science in industrial technology, a little gnat problem there, and uh, that led to a career as a mechanical engineer designing scientific instrumentation. And then uh, I decided to move back, met my wife. We're raising a family in uh, Paradise. 
And uh, it's a fabulous place, and it's going to become a fabulous place again. So, again, thank you. Thank you. Henry. <clears throat> Um, again, uh, my name is Henry Schleiger. I'm running for District 5 Supervisor. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for hosting us. Um, I'm a wildland fire professional and a father of a little two-year-old and the champion of the donkey derby, a donkey race up on Paradise. Um, I bought a house up in Megalia in 2015 knowing that um, there was a, uh, an impending disaster uh, basically hanging over the head of Paradise Megalia. Um, I, like Doug, um, think that there's a lot to be said about federal and state policy that has got us into that. Um, but there is also some pretty major structural faults in our county policy that I believe are also partially to blame. Um, I uh, have a degree in, in human geography and planning, and I think that it's time for us to plan our way out of our mess. Um, rather than uh, bumbling into another instance of, of disaster and death. Um, so I think it's time for a new direction for our county, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we're going to get started now with the first question. Now, the questions will be up here on the uh, board. I hope you guys can both see them. I can angle that a little bit more for you if you'd like. This way you don't have to... Um, you don't have to ask me to repeat it if you, if you don't need me to. Um, but I'm going to read it off to you, and then, um, um, uh, Henry, I'll give you the first chance to answer this. Please briefly explain the different, different roles of county versus city government. Then, given those realities, what is your main objective as a supervisor to support your constituents? Henry, you're up first. Okay. Um, so in my perspective, um, the way I'm looking at this situation um, the county is uh, kind of in the role of holding development back uh, in the unincorporated areas. And the cities really need to be in the role of, of opening development up uh, to increase our population and our economy within our city limits. Um, I say that I, I, don't want, I don't want our county to be thought of as anti-growth. I don't want myself to be thought of as anti-growth. Uh, we do want to grow. But uh, for the county, it's critical to keep our, our growth in the cities and uh, from sprawling out into our ag lands and into our foothills. Doug, same question. So the county is an arm of the state where a city is not. And so a county is tasked with doing a lot of things that cities don't do. The similarities are like police, fire, and uh, land use type decisions, but then it differs. The county is obligated by the state to provide social services, mental health, uh, public health. And so a lot of these departments then service the entire area, including the incorporated areas. And so that's kind of the big difference between county and city governments. And as, like Mr. Schleiger said, we all have our separate land use. But since this is really about the different roles of county versus city, I'm a more focus on that we provide the social services that go into the incorporated areas to try to alleviate the poverty that a lot of our incorporated areas have. Uh, you know, Paradise had a high number of folks that didn't earn a lot of money, Chico obviously, and Oroville. And so those are the main roles, the mental health services. Uh, you know, I think the county's role is to try to uh, alleviate the mental health problem that we see at our hospitals, the mental health problem that our police and sheriff deputies face every day. And that's a big role of the county that's funded by federal and state tax dollars. So I'd say that's the big difference. The other difference is in the county is all the ag. And you know that's why uh, the county has always been strong, even before I got there, on the green line to protect agriculture. Uh, one of the, the pluses I think that I've enjoyed at our county, which differs from a lot of other counties, is having a water department, having scientists that will actually try to understand our aquifers, what recharges them. And that's a huge uh, driver for uh, the Sigma. Uh, counties weren't really going to have a seat at the table, but our water department helped get counties and local governments a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. And Sigma? Oh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. Wonderful. Government. Cool. 
And there's that. That's what the chime sounds like. <laughs> good, good timing. Okay. Uh, next question, and and, uh, and uh, Doug, this will be your first. We're going to just alternate back and forth oh, between the reader. questions. This is a long one. Okay, I'll read it to you. District five, of course, encompasses paradise. So the ongoing recovery from the campfire remains top of mind uh, in your district and throughout the county. You each have backgrounds in firefighting and forestry management. In your opinion. What must we change going forward to reduce, reduce the risk and lessen the damage of devastating fires in Butte County? Doug? Well, speaking towards, you know, housing and, and people living in the wildlife urban interface, as people rebuild, they're going to be using a whole different building code. And those, those buildings are going to be much more resilient to fire than the houses that we had. So there's going to be a huge change that's already been implemented. It happened in 2008, the, the WUI Wildlife Urban Interface building codes that the state drove. Other things you saw with the town did was uh, the first five feet, prevent bark or fences going up against the house. The county's working on having additional rules such as the town. Uh, there's also going to be, you know, how how strong do we want to enforce defensible space? Because previously, uh, people, they liked having bushes and trees because they liked that environment of being in the woods. Uh, that's obviously changed now with, with the change in climate and the propensity in fires. So I think that those are the things that, you know, within Paradise Megalia and, and where homes are, we need to really, you know, uh, defend the defensible space laws, have code enforcement, to go out and make sure people are compliant and then also you know be sure our building practices are as good as can be now around the county is a little uh problematic as as you said we both have firefighting or fire backgrounds i actually have firefighting background and uh, i was on an emergency crew the problem with uh our topography it's super steep and it's very hard to reduce fuels in these very steep canyons. And then the other thing is most of the land around Butte County is owned by SPI. SPI is a, is a timber management company, products, and they have certain uh, best management practices and they don't wanna change on their land. It's, it's their land. Uh, then the Forest Service has many issues, underfunded, um, their, their fire, prevention is hardly fun at all because they spend it all on firefighting. Thank you. Henry, same question. Okay. Um, so I kind of got to the structural problems that have gotten us into this mess, um, and, and I'll, I'll address that. I, I, the, what Doug said is, is all true, um, for sure, and the building standards will help address some of that. Um, some of this stuff is hard for us to handle because it's SBI or it's Forest Service, so we kind of have to work with them on policy or on, on uh, <clears throat> the way they handle their lands. But <clears throat> what I want to get into is our building and living in, in the wildland urban interface. Um, what I'm kind of getting at is that decades of not densifying and not developing within our cities has ultimately led to the spread and um, density of, of people moving into the foothills. Um, and that's currently, you know, still very seriously the case in Cohasset and Forbes Town and other uh, towns that, are, that weren't burned. Um, so we have, uh, you know, uh, an imbalance. I, I, I see it as an imbalance in our economy. The housing in our towns is more expensive than what many people can afford to live and, and work in the town. So we're commuting farther and farther out into uh, the wildland or urban interface. That housing is uh, in high demand and it's, you know, we, we had many, many people living on the hill and now they're all scrambling. Um, and so Many of them are moving back onto the hill, which is great. I don't want to stop anybody from moving on, on uh, back into the foothills. But we have an imbalance in the county of where our housing is, and we need to uh, focus on putting our housing back in our cities so we can uh, reduce the, the housing uh, crunch up on the hill. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on to our next question now. Public safety. 
And Henry, this is your, your first up on this one. Public safety, of course, is a very broad issue that uh, every voter is deeply concerned about, but it may take different forms for different voters. How do you interpret and define public safety and what will you do to protect it? Henry, you're up first with this one. Uh, yeah, this defining public safety thing has gotten a lot of attention uh, lately. Um, you know, is public safety just firefighters and, and police or does it include uh, mental health and homeless services and drug addiction services and things like that? Um, you know, Doug explained how the county is responsible for so much of those services, both uh, in the incorporated and unincorporated areas. And um, I absolutely think that it is a major uh, requirement of our county to to uh, improve those services, uh, the mental health, the, the homelessness, the, uh, the drug addiction problems. Um, I know it's not cheap, um, but as far as an investment in our future goes, there is nothing greater. Um, every individual has potential, no matter where they are in their life right now, um, and every individual requires or deserves another chance. Um, so I believe it's uh, incumbent upon our government to support those who are the most vulnerable and to give them a chance to get back on their feet and help our economy again. Thank you. Doug, same question. Yeah, I think like anything, everything's a broad issue. Two minutes doesn't give it justice. <laughs> but we basically, the county has like over a $600 million budget and uh, one-fifths of that is for what I'd say is the traditional view of public safety, your sheriff, your fire department, DA, probation, operating the jail. Uh, that is always uh, a challenge to completely fund. And you know the, that's the discretionary area with supervisors, the libraries even in there. So you, know, you could see all those things as being the traditional public safety I consider even the library kind of public safety because that's where a lot of people go. Uh, it's kind of a natural cooling center and it's always a challenge. But then you have the other side, public health, mental health. Those are funded by state and federal dollars mostly. And um, I guess to lay a, a line in the sand, uh, I don't want to take our discretionary dollars. It's always a challenge to fill those traditional public safety roles and move discretionary dollars to increase, say, mental health. Uh, I believe we need to lobby the state to increase mental health funding because that, you know, is, as a county, we're an arm of the state and the state needs to pick up those dollars for us. And so that's kind of how I view the different uh, roles, but those traditional roles uh, we really need because, you know, the first responder for any medical call is our fire department. And if we don't have a well-staffed fire department, we're not going to be able to reach those people. The county pays what's called AMDOR stations. There's some CAL FIRE stations. One's in Cohasset. Um, Banger has one, uh, Jarbo Gap. Uh, in the winter, CAL FIRE would normally close those. We use discretionary funding to keep those open so that way people in those communities will have a fire station response. Thank you. All right, next question, and this is gonna be uh, for you, Doug, to start with. Um, water management. Uh, water management, of course, is another key issue on the ridge and throughout the state. Explain as briefly as possible, again, two minutes, sorry, uh, the situation with the Paradise Irrigation District and whether or not, in your opinion, the PID can remain as a financially viable entity during the time it takes Paradise to repopulate. You know, if the, if the state would backfill them uh, equally like they did the county and town with three years, PID would have more time but they were only given two years of backfill, so we're already over a year into it. Uh, I think it's over 90% of their customers are gone. Uh, they need to pay for the treatment plant to provide uh, to the remaining customers, and that's, that's the pickle they're in. Uh, they could sell untreated water, but uh, there's not a lot of money in untreated water, and so they'd rather sell treated water. And so it was really, uh, the issue has been about a study of possibly carrying a pipeline. Uh, Cal Water could then utilize the water, uh, but the desire that has been presented was that it would be spread across all the Vina Basin, you know, the ag users, the home 
well owners and Cal Water. So before even getting there, uh, I would have liked to seen the study done because if the cost of the pipe or even if the water rights weren't able to transfer, then it would be a mute point. And so that's, that's kind of the big inner tie discussion. Uh, I was obviously in strong support of it. Other options is maybe they could bottle the water. Uh, the state buys a lot of water uh, for disasters. The state buys a lot of bottled water for itself. Uh, why couldn't they do a bottling plant and then you know, help carry PID through by bottling water that the state you know, or the federal government uses to help offset? Um, so we made some connections there, but that's, that's, uh, I guess, the concern is they got to do a consolidation study. Uh, would they consolidate with the town? Well, the town's in the same pickle. Would it be fair that they consolidate with a private company such as Del Oro or Cal Water? But they're a Prop 218 organization, so any increase the voters have to approve. Henry. Um, well, uh, I, I don't really oppose uh, the idea of an, of an inner tie. Um, I think that the inner tie um, is obviously, um, you know, an, an option for financial viability of PID. Um, but I think the timeline that we're talking about um, to put in that, that inner tie, uh, and then when is paradise population starting to come back, um, that just seems a little... Um, like it might not work. Um, and and I, I'm not saying that that's, you know, we're just at the study stage at this point. Um, but anyways, the, the bigger question about the study and whether or not that pipeline down the Skyway makes sense, I believe is in <clears throat> our questions around growth, <clears throat> or how that part of Chico will develop <clears throat> and how the, the area between Paradise and Chico will, will develop on the lower Skyway. I think if we had a plan in mind for that, if we had a area specific plan for the lower skyway, um, I wouldn't have any real objection to the idea of bringing a pi pipeline down if it still made sense uh, viably and, and financially. I absolutely don't want to see PID go under. They're a public entity and keeping their public status I think is very important. I don't know if maybe they couldn't be uh, absorbed into either another public entity, uh, another pu public water district or something, or or like you said, a merger with the, with the town of Paradise or something. But um, I, I really don't want to see PID go away at all. Thank you. All right, our next question. And Henry, this is going to be your start at this, for this one. Um, Butte has a, a median household income that's in the bottom quartile of counties within California. What steps would you take to help improve the economic outlook for your constituents? Henry, that's yours. Great. So um, again, I think the cities in our county are the economic engines of, of this county, and they need to uh, step up and develop. Um, we have a lot of underdeveloped and kind of decrepit areas within uh, Chico and Orville, and it's time for those to redevelop and uh, you know, bring vitality and uh, you know, uh, industry back into, our, back into our towns, back into our cities. Um, Paradise has plans to uh, densify in the lower parts of Paradise. They are finally going to do a sewer system, and I think that's huge. Um, but what's really uh, a challenge, it seems like, in this county is housing affordability for so many people um, at, 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 at various different levels of income. Uh, it's hard for people to find the housing that they're looking for in this town, in this, in this county. And that's why we need to build. And that's why I'm running on a let's build now uh, uh, platform. I'm an environmentalist. I don't want to see us build into green fields and into uh, sensitive areas, but I do want to see us build build up in our cities, build taller, not wider. Thank you. Doug, same question to you. Uh, I think to improve the economic outlook for Butte County, we need the four lanes to Sacramento. Part of our problem is we're not on I-5, and that's the commercial corridor. And the better access that we have to Sacramento is going to improve our outlook, especially for businesses. 
Uh, broadband. Broadband is an issue for all rural counties. And if you can't have like two companies providing high speed broadband, a lot of big companies won't come here. They want to back up. So we might be able to provide them one broadband connection, but they can't get that backup that they desire. Uh, so that's holding us back. That's been an ages old problem. California never seems to fund that, but we're always fighting for that. Uh, the housing, you know, the governor made a huge change uh, to combat NIMBYism by uh, allowing people to put accessory dwelling units in their backyard. And, you know, that, that's probably a battleground, but we need housing and we need affordable housing. And, you know, I grew up with, you know, a house up front and rental units in the back. And I think that's an important way for people to provide low cost housing in you know, the urban setting. Uh, I don't oversee Paradise, so I'll, I'll talk about Megalia. Megalia has uh, an entire population on septic. Quarter acre lots is pretty much the norm in the area that was burned. So it's gonna be very difficult to add density when you have quarter acre lots. A lot of those places were two bedroom, two bath. But, you know, the prices of those lots are fairly low right now, and we could definitely rebuild up there, you know, most of them were two bedroom, two bath, a uh, great place for families. And so, you know, pushing the development onto those already existing lots would be a good call. And then one thing I always believe is, is an economic driver is good recreation. And I've always thought that's, you know, when I said I got mad at the Forest Service, it was about them providing recreation. And the more recreation we have, the more likely families will move here. Thank you, Doug. All right, our next question, and this is going to be, um, I think this is your, your question, Doug, to start with. Uh, yeah, I think it's yours. Yeah, we're kind of alternating. So, <laughs> so what in your view are the most important infrastructure upgrades that our county needs to supercharge our economic competitiveness in the coming years? Wow, maybe we should yeah. go back. <laughs> Whatever I just said. <laughs> well, to, to add to that, you know, and it wasn't my idea, but uh, we're looking at a community choice aggregation, looking at purchasing power. You know, whatever happens to PG&E, someone's going to manage the lines and getting electricity or a house. But at least we could come up with power options that could hopefully beat PG&E's pricing, but also allow, uh, there was a project uh, on uh, Nimshu Ridge up in the, the hills where it was going to be a large megawatt solar. And it would be great if we had our CCA, that solar company could feed a business uh, like Roplast that uses a lot of electricity directly through the CCA and really save that company a lot of money. And so getting competitive power pricing would be a big boon for our county and for people to come here. Uh, we don't get any power uh, economy out of Lake Oroville uh, like Shasta does or Redding does with Shasta. And uh, so that's you know something we've always been fighting for. If we can get cheaper power, companies are going to want to build here. And then you know to reiterate, uh, especially in light of the campfire and and the the spillway incident, heavy trucks really beat up our roads. Uh, good quality roads are going to want you know to have people, or you're going to need good quality roads to have your citizens be happy and also your business owners because they're. Their equipment is going to get beat up traveling those those bumpy roads, just like our cars do. And so I think, besides the other thing I said, the four lanes and the infrastructure of, I mean, the the broadband, mm -hmm. that would be great for our competitive advantage. Thank you, Henry. Um, the you know in, in, increased highway capacity and and uh, I, I'd also really like to see. Uh, completed uh, interchanges at Eaton Road and Neal Road on Highway 99. Um, those are bottlenecks that seem to be problems, especially that Eaton Road uh, off-ramps. Crazy sometimes. Um, but I think the other big infrastructure concern that we have, and I don't know if this is really an economic area, but um, we still have uh, several areas uh, that we should improve our egress routes out of the foothills. Um, on November 8th, I went out on a, the road called Garland Road that goes between uh, Megalia and uh, uh, 
Forest Ranch, and that cut our evacuation time down enormously and distance down enormously. Um, I'd really like to see that route paved. It's um, and just publicized. I was <laughs> the really shocking part about that experience was how few people were on that road at that time. Um, there was only a few, handful of people on the road with me um, at one o'clock in the afternoon or so on on November eighth. Um, so, uh, in improving our egress routes and our evacuation routes um, in the foothills is a really really important part of uh, safety. Thank you, Henry. All right, and Henry, this is your uh, kickoff here. Then this next question, uh, and we're going to go back to uh, housing stock. Affordable housing stock was a problem, of course, in Butte County even before the campfire, and it's now far worse. So, what can the the Board of Supervisors do to uh, encourage, cajole, force, <laughs> whatever verb you want you want to use uh, to to encourage the development of these types of projects? Yeah. So I think there's some cajoling that needs to happen. Um, uh, you know, the county oversees the unincorporated land. We really want that uh, development and density in the incorporated areas, but I think it's the county's role to um, kind of act as the hub for that um, when uh, development is proposed in the uh, unincorporated area. We need to work out compromises or um, cost-sharing arrangements so that we can push some of that uh, back into the cities as well and redevelop some areas like, say, South Park Avenue. <clears throat> um, using development funds, um, you know, from some of that other more, more lucrative development that people might be after. Control. Thank, thank you. Control. <laughs> Doug. Yeah, I think encourage is about it. Uh, <laughs> you know, private property rights I'm a firm believer yeah, in, sure. and it's, it's ultimately up to the landowner. Uh, but before 2008, you know, the, the housing market crash, there, there were plenty of projects planned and uh, in and out, you know, in the incorporated area and outside. And all those kind of got shelved. And so, you know, we have the list at the county. Uh, people have asked about the list of parcel maps and projects. And so as the county, we need to push that out as much as possible. Here, here are these ones that are already pra practically shovel ready. Um, they're not quite shovel ready, but they're closer than anything else. Then we, then we have Paradise uh, and Megalia that uh, I think we should strive for grants like we've gotten to help reduce uh, building permit costs because any cost you can shave off, it's going to lead a developer uh, to want to, or a, or a contractor that just wants to build maybe 10 homes or something. They're going to go to that area because they can get a, a, a better return on their investment the more their costs are reduced. I think some of the problems that we don't have control over is what's going to happen with insurance rates in our, our WUI or wildlife urban air interface areas. And uh, we've been, as a supervisors, writing, you know, the commissioner going, what are you going to do? But that's really going to be a driver for development in the WUI areas is what's going to happen with insurance. This power safety shutoff, plan power safety shutoffs is killing us as well. We, we need a power company that's going to provide consistent power because who wants to live in an area that just gets shut off year, you know, month after month? That just can't continue. So those, those are the hurdles that the board really needs to address. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. All right, and this is the final question of this uh, and before we get to the, the Q&A from the audience, uh, and, and Doug, you're going to kick this one off. Um, so ours is a complex and diverse county containing residents and elected officials holding, in many cases, diametrically opposed viewpoints, to put it mildly. Uh, describe your ability to work with those who want different things than you do, and tell us how you manage to find common ground. So, Doug, if you can start with that. That's good for these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, th I think the, the interesting part of five people on a board is, you know, you're a fraction. And uh, to win a vote, you just need three. And so I'm comfortable with three twos. You know, I'd, I'd love to have uh, una unanimous decisions, but that's just not going to happen. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just striving to uh, get my three twos these days. Uh, I feel it's, it's challenging with Paradise 
and uh, some of the decisions that have been made. And you know, the common ground for me is what's best for my community. And uh, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'm happy with an opposing view. It's just I'm gonna strive to get those three twos these days. So, um, but I do go and I represent the county uh, at a state organization, 37 counties, and we work together uh, to try to get bipartisan changes at the state and federal level. And that's really, you know, that's where our money comes to the county. And obviously California is uh, driven by a certain party. And if you're not able to cross those party lines and uh, meet in the middle or meet somewhere, because, you know, lucky for us, LA County has worse mental health and homeless problems than we do. And so you find those common grounds and that's where you do your work to bring that money back to help your rural communities. Thank you. Henry, same question. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think that the goals that I want to work towards as a supervisor uh, are going to be pretty well shared amongst all of the constituencies in the county. Um, obviously, everybody's got their personalities, but um, I don't think anybody can really object to the idea of developing in our cities more. I think um, one of the main divisions in this kind of city versus rural idea is this idea that we're going to gentrify or cityfy the rural areas. And that's, you know, a lot of the objection we get from the, from the rural folks. I don't want to do that. That's, that's not my intention at all. Um, I, I really respect the qualities and the nature of our rural agricultural areas, and, and I love that. I grew up in Durham um, on Butte Creek and running around in the orchards, and I, I, I you know, hated that era in the 90s when orchards were coming down all over the place and houses were going up in their places. Um, I, I think that the, the goals that I want to work towards are the goals that everybody in this county um, really uh, should be looking towards. Um, I don't, don't want to say that in like a, hey, don't you think you should be doing this kind of thing? But um, I think when, when everybody thinks about it, um, what I'm moving towards is, is where we all really want to go. Thank you, Henry. All right, well, we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, that's it for my questions, but I do want to turn to a few questions we've gotten in. And we're going to do, uh, I think, just a minute a piece on the questions from the audience. And Henry, this first one will be for you, and, and then uh, Doug, you can answer it after that. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but maybe you can expand on it in, in this segment. Um, what is the connection between our housing crisis and the wildlife, wildland urban interface wildfire problem? Um, in, in my mind and um, in the planning education that I received and, and, and the wildfire education that I received, um, um, it, it, it's, been, it's been pointed out to me that, that we developed much too freely into the wildland urban interface with very little planning. Uh, during some periods in the mostly 70s, maybe into the 80s um, when it was kind of the Wild West. Um, a, a planner friend referred to it as developing for dollars. Um, and, and I think that that greed essentially put many, many people at risk um, to the effects of the campfire. And, um, you know, e even some of those deaths, I think, should be, should be accounted for by... Um, by the poor planning and, and you could say greed um, by our county in the past. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, and again, this kind of springs off something we talked about already. Already, What is the connection between our housing crisis and the wildland urban interface wildfire problem? We kind of talked about it a little bit, but maybe you can expand upon it a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, to take a little different track, uh, I think the high cost to produce homes, whether in the WUI or they're in uh, you know, our flatlands. That's the real problem with affordable housing. You know, the, the state has, and the, the federal government has pretty much killed the timber industry. We used to have mills around here. You know, the more co competition you have, the lower prices uh, sticks are going to be, which equate to lower price homes. Uh, also, the, the, 
way the board has tried to improve housing affordability is with Title 25 versus Title 24 construction. Title 25 was used after the Concow fire in 2008. People could mill their own lumber, build their house. They didn't need to have uh, a HVAC system uh, so that they could have a fireplace in there as their main source of heat. It doesn't work in all our communities, but those are some of the things we've done. Yeah, it's a little different, sorry. <laughs> All right, next question, uh, and this will be for you, for you, Doug, to start with. What does protect our water mean to you? Well, quite a few things, and one minute's not enough. <laughs> Obviously, the first and foremost is, you know, don't send our water south permanently. Uh, also, we need to make sure our water is clean and safe to drink and that we have uh, ample supply of water to uh, do our number one industry, which is agriculture. And, uh, you know, I think it's sad, like take Megalia Reservoir. Uh, it was built years ago when things were built willy nilly, it's downgraded. If we could get the funding to rebuild it, there's uh, a whole bunch of capacity for water. And so that's probably, you know, to roll back to the PID is there's a lot of water that could be there that the town can't use, even if the town was fully uh, built up because of conser conservation measures that the state is driving. And the state's really working towards a 50 gallons per person a day. I don't know how they're gonna force that, but that's gonna leave some water available in PID that could be delivered elsewhere in Butte County. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I know it's a, it's, it's a tight. <laughs> All right, Henry, same question to you. Okay, so protecting our water, um, I mean, I agree with Doug. I, I, I don't want to see us selling water south um, unless we're just so flush with it that we um, have extra. Um, but that protecting our water thing, to me, the, the, the key to that is protecting our groundwater. Um, and a big concern I have is uh, injection pumping schemes, um, which are talking about injecting even maybe treated water uh, into the aquifer to refill it. Um, I think this is a very bad idea. Um, I don't think that we uh, should be trying to recharge our aquifer by anything other than natural uh, methods. Um, if our aquifer is falling, then we need to deal with that on a structural basis, not by pumping more water uh, from the surface down into the aquifer. Uh, so for protecting our water, I, I, I say it's protecting our aquifer and that quality of that pure, clean uh, ancient water. Thank you. Henry, this one will be for you. Um, what role should the Board of Supervisors play in seeing that Paradise redevelops in a way that is safer than before the campfire? Um, so I would really like to see, uh, I mean, again, I don't want to tell anybody not to, to come back to the ridge. I mean, there's enough uh, impediments and, and uh, hesitation to coming back to the ridge. I don't ever want anybody to think that I'm, I'm saying not to come back to the ridge. Um, but what I do want to see is, is some more sense to the way population is distributed around the ridge. It was really uh, diffuse before with no real core and uh, pockets of pretty significant density kind of all over the ridge willy-nilly. And again, this is decades of poor planning and uh, kind of soft rules that, that went into play uh, before the incorporation of, of Paradise. Um, and because that was structural problems that, that came from the county, I believe that it's the county's responsibility to try and work our way out of that. <clears throat> Doug, same question for you. I can read it to you again if you'd like. Uh, no, I think I okay. got the gist of that one. Got it. <laughs> so, you know, the town's the town. They have their own council. We have to respect that. We support them by having ample evacuation routes. And, uh, you know, I think we have good evacuation routes. They just need to be trimmed back. Uh, you know, my experience, I made it a quarter mile from my house, and I witnessed uh, what happens to cars when vegetation is too close to the roads. If we, as a county, give Paradise the clearances they need, you know, all the way to Butte Meadows, the three lanes all the way out, you know, better timing with the signals down at Neal. People could have been in their cars and been perfectly safe and survivable 
without all these flames next to them. That's the biggest role I think the county could play. Also, uh, a well-funded uh, mutual aid fire system. The town uh, has a contract with Cal Fire. The county has a contract. So it's, it's kind of a match made in heaven that we're both using Cal Fire for the employees. We need to continue to support that. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna, I have a few questions here on um, my text message that I want to uh, ask you guys, and this will be for you first, Doug. Um, could you elaborate on your ideas on how to increase population density in cities and reduce sprawl into the urban wildlife interface? Well, again, we don't control the cities. What they do is entirely up to their elected officials and their citizens, uh, but we can support them. Uh, you know, preventing sprawl uh, into the ag land, I've always uh, been a staunch supporter of the green line, and we haven't wavered on that. The other th thing is a 300-foot ag setback. We've, we've shown how strong we can be about that as a board. I fully support the 300 feet for all new development, uh, so it doesn't inhibit our agriculture. Uh, there's areas, our general plan, uh, we're going to redo uh, the general plan, do an update for the Megalia area. Uh, their commercial area hasn't really uh, taken off, and so that will be a good public process. Uh, but the general plan kind of lays out where development. The state mandates that we plan for growth, certain amounts of growth. Well, that all should be re-looked at because of the campfire and the huge number of homes. And so those are the things the county can do to help support the cities. But we can't cross that line. We don't govern them. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that the county can't tell the city what to do, um, but uh, I think for a long time our counties have basically been holding the cities back because the counties have allowed uh, development in drips and drabs uh, into the unincorporated and, and foothills, um, and, and, and that has affected the market in the cities. Um, if, if most of the development is happening in the unincorporated areas, then there's less going on in the cities. So I think it's our county's role, uh, like I said earlier, to push back on that and to push our development into the cities. I know we can't tell the cities to develop, but we can tell the counties that it, we can tell you know the county that it's time to put to, to push in back into the city. Does that make some kind of sense? Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a couple couple more, um, and let's take this one. This one's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it to you. I may need to read it again. This is going to be your start here, Henry. Um, my name is Jesse. I'm a person with a spinal cord injury, and I rely on many county services, including in-home health care services, IHSS. These services are constantly under threat of cuts and are already paying home health care workers a minimum wage. With baby boomers retiring and becoming more in need of these services, how do you plan to make sure seniors and the disabled keep access to these services and stay in their homes? Henry. Uh, I think the IHSS program is a great safety net um, for people in this county. Um, the fact that the workers are... Uh, essentially underpaid and um, that they they have to struggle and fight for every every little thing that they get um, I think is, is pretty sad um, this is a program that really helps a lot of people in our county and and doesn't just help the uh, you know the patient um, it it helps give a livelihood to that to that supporter as well um, so in my mind I, I think that we should try and strengthen that program um, the lack of incentive, the lack of pay, uh, makes it uh, not a particularly strong incentive for, for folks to enter the program. Um, so I think if we can in increase that incentive a little bit more, we, we see more folks in that program and see more people helped uh, by that program. Thank you, Henry. Doug. I think it's a great program. problem I have is we're in negotiations with the union that represents the employees. So I can't tell you what... I think about mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, that's one of the unfairnesses of government. I think every door should be opened. I think the public should see what we're negotiating, what's being presented across the table. But right now, state law prevents that. And so, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about their pay because we're negotiating that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have asked the state to be the entity responsible for the IHSS program. State creates a lot of programs that they pass to the county, 
and they don't always give us the funding necessary to fulfill that mission. Uh, I think IHSS is one of those programs, and the state was super close to taking it back, and it was a real tragedy, I think, for the IHSS workers that the state kind of re changed their mind. So I'll just leave it at that. Great. Thank you. Wow, perfect timing. All right, I'm going to take one more question and then let you guys get to your evening. You've been very accommodating with your time. Um, let's take this one here for both candidates. And this is going to be, I think, uh, I think Doug, yeah, you start with this one. Yep. Yeah. This is the last one before we give it your guys your closing statements for both candidates. A lot of veterans I know have long been working with supervisors toward uh, towards a veterans park. Do you support this? And specifically, why do you support it and how will we get it done? So that's that's your. Oh, I know a lot about it. Okay, cool. I'm glad you're first. Oh, you ready just, for me here? Uh, I am. Uh, sorry, I don't know why my. But go ahead. I'll 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 catch up. <laughs> all right. So you know that's actually been a, a goal of Supervisor Conley before he even got elected, and uh, they're building a memorial to veterans in Oroville, and uh, always been supportive of it. Uh, I think this question stems from a recreation grant that came up. Uh, I chose to be the odd person out, not because I have no dis I mean, I, have, I, I don't want veterans to have a memorial, uh, but I felt it was a recreation grant and it was something Miguelia just doesn't have. So I supported my citizens. And that's one of the things as an elected official, uh, you gotta take care of your home Otherwise, you don't get elected again. And, you know, kids up there have nowhere to go except for the town of Paradise. There's no sidewalks. Uh, there's hardly any bus routes. 90% uh, of the schools, on, at least at Cedarwoods, on the free lunch program. So I hope people can understand why I supported the use of that grant to Miguelia. Thank you, Doug. And Henry, same question. Uh, yeah, fair enough. I, I, I can't object to putting another park in Megalia. Um, Megalia is definitely hurting for services and, and uh, the comforts of, of modern life up there. Um, but I am a Navy veteran, and I do strongly support putting a veterans park in this county somewhere as well. Um, maybe we could put it in Megalia. <laughs> I don't think, think Bill would go for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 400 grand. Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we're going we're gonna to move on to closing statements. Henry, you got the chance to do the first closing statement here because uh, you were the second on the opening statement. So go ahead. You have two minutes for this one. Um, I just want to uh, take this opportunity to thank everybody who came out tonight and everybody who's been influential and uh, helpful in my campaign. Um, this has been an incredible uh, learning and growing experience for myself. Um, I could not do it at all without all the support um, that I've gotten. It's an incredible emotional roller coaster, and the lows are pretty low. Um, so the highs um, that have been provided by my friends and, and followers have been uh, really, really essential. Um, I don't really have anything else to say, except uh, I hope that I win your support and that you'll vote for me. And thank you very much for everything that I've gotten from, from all of you. Thank you, Henry. Doug. Ditto on everyone coming out. I <laughs> uh, also want to thank Henry for running. I've always had competition. Normally, I have three others running against me, so I always had to do a runoff. Mm -hmm. So uh, by Henry running and no one else, we're going to get her done in March 3rd. <laughs> Obviously, I, I think people should vote for me, uh, not because I've been there eight years, uh, but because uh, of the things I've done in the community. Uh, I want to be there for the 2030 revision uh, in Megalia. If I don't have this seat, I'll be there anyhow. I'm strongly connected to my community. Uh, also, um, evacuation routes are a huge concern of mine. Uh, who better to go down to the state uh, but the guy who made it a quarter from a mile from his house and had to shelter in place with 10 or 20 other cars in a field. Uh, you know, that sells volumes down at the state, personal experience. Uh, also, uh, public safety is a, a big, the traditional forms of public safety, and uh, that's why uh, I have the Sheriff Honey endorsing me, I have the uh, CAL FIRE firefighters 
local 2881 Butte chapter endorsing my campaign. And I also have the Sheriff Deputy Association, also two retired fire chiefs. Uh, one's Jim Brochiers, who's an instrumental on the Fire Safe Council. I've been on the Fire Safe Council for over eight years. Uh, now funding is starting to roll in, and I want to be there to support that great organization. I've spent two years on Sierra Nevada Conservancy representing our county. Uh, I have an opportunity to be back on that board, and uh, that was a great experience. And uh, I was actually the vice chair of that board, uh, appointed by you know a wide selection of state appointees and also county supervisors to that role. Also, uh, there's uh, rural county representatives of California. I want to take a leadership position there. Sorry, I great. No, there. no, no, you guys did, sure. guys did great. Well, thank you both for being here. Really appreciate your time tonight, coming and meeting our, our community and, and having uh, this exchange. And I want everybody to encourage a round of applause for our candidates, please. Thank you, and that was District 5, Megalia Paradise, Butte County Supervisors, Henry Slager, and Doug Teeter. Yeah, run it, run it for that, that race. Again, Mar March 3rd, we're going to keep on saying that here. March 3rd coming up real soon is your deadline date to get your ballots in the mail uh, if you're in that district. Um, However, Mike, yep. one strategy is to wait just a little bit before you mail that thing in because you never know who's going to drop out of the presidential here in the next couple weeks. Hey, so. You know, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, uh, but there's people on the ballot that have already dropped out. True, right? true. I mean, so, you know, you can still vote for those there's people on the ballot. I have no idea who they are. <laughs> that's true, too. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them there, yeah. but that was it. That was a fun, fun uh, forum. Yes, uh, session that was that really informative. Area of the campfire, you know, very passionate people that running. Uh, good that people. is really, really good people. Yeah. Uh, really hard to step up uh, into politics. You see people that have political, you know, uh, aspirations. Something like that happens, and they run the other way. Mm -hmm. And these people who are stepping up to r to run in those races, you know that they have a heart. You know that they're good and they want change because otherwise they wouldn't do that. That's a tough, tough job. And, and there's some leaders there that are really passionate about uh, uh, having that leadership in the, in the regrowth of that town. So it's, it's, it's really important, not only for the, the county, but for the state as a whole. It's, it's healthy, I think, to have these, these elections where you know, people are engaged, you have good candidates stepping up and running, running good, aggressive, hard campaigns, mm -hmm. you know, kind of getting to the issues and letting people kind of weigh those issues. I mean, that's the way it's supposed yeah. to work. Yeah. And you know, it, it really does work better, in my opinion, uh, locally than it does you know, nationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it just gets so watered down nationally. There's so many issues with different yeah, regions yeah. of the country. It's hard for a president to really represent everybody mm -hmm. in this weird, crazy, you know, diverse country of ours. But locally is when you really see people dig into those issues. You heard Henry and Doug in that segment really talk about some of the issues with water yes. uh, and, and with some of the other fire recovery that really affect the people in their district. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good example of how that could work. Yeah. yeah. And we have another one. So also at the, uh, the other day, as I mentioned at CBI, at Congregation Beth Israel, we had, of course, Sue Hildebrand. Now, Todd Kimmelshue, who's running against Sue in District 4, had a conflict. He couldn't show up the other day, which was unfortunate. But we wanted to give Sue a platform. We felt that it was fair. She showed up and that she should get a platform and be able to talk to the, the people that were there. So Sue had a little statement, and then we have some questions to the audience for mm -hmm. Sue. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. All right, well, I'd like to welcome now Sue Hildebrand joining us. She's a candidate for supervisor in District 4. Uh, so Sue, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Yeah, we Thanks appreciate so much. you. I appreciate it. Appreciate you joining us. So we're going to give you a five-minute segment to kind of do your opening and closing statements all in one shot. So take it away, and you can you can have five. And then we're going to have questions from the audience. We have several questions for you from the audience already queued up. So go right ahead. You got it. All right. I'm even timing myself, so you don't have to time <laughs> me. So. So I'm Sue Hildebrand. I'm running for Butte County Board of Supervisors to represent District 4, and I want to Thank everyone for, for being here, I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to, to Mike and to Chris and to Aaron with NorCal News Now. So the reason that I'm running for county supervisor is because I have the skills and the experience that Butte County needs right now. You could say that um, I'm, a, I'm a reluctant politician, I never really saw myself doing this. And uh, after the campfire, um, what's needed right now, I happen to know how to do. And so when I was recruited to do this, I really had to think about it and realize that, that if I have the skills that are needed, 
it's the very least I could do for Butte County. So, so to, to clarify what I mean by this moment, then I can tell you about what my skills are. But in this moment, post campfire, Butte County is in a pretty, um, um, I hate to say desperate moment, but we are. We are a, a community in crisis. We are suffering from a lot of trauma. Um, our county budget is absolutely overwhelmed, and the mental health services, the, the, the drug and alcohol addiction services are, are completely overwhelmed, and they were before the campfire. I know that many folks know that about five weeks before the campfire, the Chico City Council actually declared a shelter emergency. So we, we've, we've had some serious problems even before the campfire and then we lost 14,000 homes and our county budget is overwhelmed. The skills that I possess that I think are needed now is I'm a political scientist, um, I have a background in public policy and I have a long history in long-term strategic planning. And the, the truth is, we have, since the campfire, we have been looking at solving the problems in a very reactive way, which is completely understandable. We need to really start to refocus our, um, our energies and start to be proactive. We have to figure out how are we going to provide the services that are desperately needed in a way that is more efficient and more effective with our limited budget. Okay, I'm looking at my tag. <laughs> so, um, so again, um, the bat, one of the things that I, one of the many things that I've done that I think are needed at this time is, I have, uh, I've, I've worked at state government in the state of Arizona, um, and, and like I mentioned, I, I understand um, public policy. When I moved to California, when I moved to Butte County, um, I started doing radio, and I've been doing community radio for about 12 years, and one of the things about radio is that in order to ask good questions, you have to have a basic understanding about the topics that you're talking about. What I'm very good at is having very little understanding of an issue, but having the ability and having the intelligence and having the humility to ask the right questions so that I can actually add very, ask very good questions. I am, I am curious enough to find the answers to what is needed. Um, and then the most important thing where I think the county needs to go at this point is my background in long-term strategic planning. The way that you do strategic planning is you don't decide what you're going to do right now. What you do is you decide what, you're, what you want the world to look like in 20 years from now. And you imagine that. And what I always like to, to, to tell groups that I'm working with, I, I ask them to imagine what they would like to read about in 20 years. What does the world look like in 20 years if we've been successful? So. We're going to have a clean environment. We're going to have a healthy economy. We're not going to have homelessness. Um, we are going to have um, um, housing development in places that are not environmentally sensitive. So if we know where we're going, then we can take a step back and say, what does that mean for 10 years from now? What does that mean in five years? What does that mean we have to, what does that mean? I'm timing myself, Mike. <laughs> You're be. What does that mean that we have to do right away? Um, and so I look at this opportunity as not just recovering, but I look at this opportunity at this moment in the county's history of how do we overcome in a way that addresses the problems that existed long before the campfire? And how do we move this county forward? Because there's a lot of development that is getting ready to happen to Butte County. So how do we manage that in a way that we are excited about what is produced after this work? So thank you. Thank you, Sue. Wonderful. Well, I, as I mentioned, we do have a, a number of questions from the audience for you. We want to give you a chance to answer them. We're going to, um, I, I think we can do maybe 90 seconds. How does that sound? I'll, I'll let you tell me what you think is, is adequate. I mean, I think 90 seconds is probably fine for these, these answers. So um, the first one, um, I think, is, is an interesting one. Um, I think they're all interesting, but I want to pose this to you. Uh, Butte County has the possibility of a female majority for the first time. 
uh, as on the Board of Supervisors, of course. Do you feel that this will have any effect on decisions related to health and welfare, emergency preparedness, and others? Yes. Yes, I do. I think it's going to make a huge difference, and I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity. Women, there's exceptions to everything that we say when we make these generalizations, but um, women, women tend to cooperate a bit more than men. Um, and I think that's what's needed at this moment. Um, we, for example, we do have, we do have um, serious mental illness in the county. We don't have the ability to deal with it. So one of the things that I think that is being discussed um, um, at the county level um, is that we need to start coordinating with surrounding counties. If we actually cooperated with surrounding counties, we could be talking about a regional mental health facility. What that does is it lightens the burden on Butte County itself. What that does is it allows us to start thinking, to keeping people here in the region as opposed to having people going far away. Um, and, it's, and it's much more cost effective if we do that. But I think women generally are more cooperative and I think it could be an exciting time for Butte County to move forward. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Next question. Um, do you support or oppose the sit and lie ordinance and why? I think that the sit lie ordinance is a very costly band-aid approach to the homeless situation. What the sit lie ordinance does is it, 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 it often will end up with people going to jail and it doesn't address the deeper issue of, of homelessness. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's useful in terms of addressing the real problems. Um, it is a city issue, it's not a county issue. And if that's what the city would like to do, um, there's nothing I can do about that. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. All right, next question. Um, and this is from a, a, a bicyclist. That's the right term, bike, a bike fan. Um, how, will they, how will the candidate, this candidate, in, the, in, in this case, your case, improve bike safety in Chico from fixing potholes to making sure massive pile, piles of leaves aren't left in bike lanes on busy streets for weeks on end to educating drivers about passing cyclists safely? So what, what remedies could you suggest for that? Those are, those are city issues. Okay. Those right. are city issues, yeah. Okay. I'll let the city deal with that. Okay. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough as well. All right. I have one. I have a few here on email. Um, okay. With respect to mental health and homelessness, homeless services, there have been recent discussions in Butte County regarding implementation of Laura's Law. What is your stance on this issue? My, my gut reaction on Laura's Law is um, I, I think we need to start thinking, um, we need to start thinking about, okay, let me, let me start again. I actually support Laura's Law. And the reason that I say that is because I have a, a handful of friends that deal with close family members that are dealing with serious mental illness. And these are the biggest proponents that I have ever met for Laura's Law. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm smart enough to know how to do the research in order to come up with good decisions. Um, I don't have, personally, I don't have experience with, with people that have serious mental illness. I've never had to deal with that on a personal level. But, the, but, but these friends of mine have told me time and time and time again that this is a tool that they would need in order to keep their loved ones safe. And so I have to support them, and um, so I would support it. I think it's a good idea. Can you, for the benefit of those who don't know the, the law, Laura's Law, can you describe that quickly, what that's all about? It allows, um, it allows people with serious mental illness going through trauma um, to be, um, um, I, I can't think of the right word, um, to be, I want to say hospitalized, but that's not quite the right word, to be... Um, Institutionalized, thank you. Thank you in the crowd. Um, institutionalized um, involuntarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, we have a few more questions here on the email, on the, uh, on the text message, I should say. Um, okay. Um, can you tell us how your views on the Butte County Resource Conservation Plan differ from your opponents based only on what um, has been publicly stated, not wanting you to speculate? The, the uh, Butte Conservation Plan, um, the Regional Conservation Plan, um, I have a lot of respect for. Um, I, I, I have a friend who spent, I, you know, I think seven years or ten years actually working on that plan. Um, I have a lot of respect for the science that went into that plan. Um, and for, for people that don't know about the plan, it is a way to streamline development in our county because through the work of of, um, of scientists, of environmentalists, of people that have done the research. They have already identified sensitive environmental areas and have identified areas that really could be developed. Um, and, and the way that it streamlines that is it, it, it keeps developers from having to go through all of the environmental um, requirements. I think it's a good plan. Um, I think that we are going to have to develop, and I think to have a plan that has already done the environmental um, impact uh, research has uh, uh, has um, has already identified those those sensitive areas. It would allow us to more cost effectively and to more quickly develop, um, and it's purely voluntary. It's an absolutely voluntary program. So, for example. Farmers can opt into this program. This is not imposed. This is not any kind of taking. Um, and from what I understand, my opponent um, does not support the plan. Um, I know that the Farm Bureau does not support the plan. Um, and I, I don't know why, because it's a purely voluntary program. Okay, fair enough. All right, we're getting a few questions here, um, kind of around the same area, and I'll, so I'll just ask this one, which I think encapsulates both of them. How do you feel about the PID intertie, and what about the potential for the Tuscan Ridge being developed to more than one to more than 1,000 units? When we talk about water in Butte County, it's, um, we cannot make any serious mistakes. We cannot make any mistakes that are permanent. Um, Maybe the inner tie is a good idea, the idea of bringing a, a pipeline um, from, you know, using, using PID water and bringing a water pipeline down to, um, down to the valley. Maybe it's a good idea, but I don't think we have enough information to actually um, decide if it's a good idea. The, some of the more critical issues for me is we don't know who's going to pay for that pipeline. I, uh, I, I don't think that taxpayers should be stuck with the bill. So if we're going to do a real study, we need to, we need to find out who's going to pay for that. Another part of that is very concerning is if PID, if Paradise Irrigation District, actually enters into a partnership with Cal Water, um, I, I, it could be problematic if we don't understand the long-term impact of the water rights. I would really hate for those water rights to be lost in the shuffle and now owned by a private corporation. Um, one idea that has been floated, which I think we should seriously consider, is if that water is going to move. One of the requirements by the state um, is that Paradise Irrigation District had to enter into a partnership within two years. It could enter into a partnership with Butte County. It does make sense if we actually think about if the water of Butte County is going to be, if, if the water of Butte County is to stay in Butte County, maybe it should be controlled by the people of Butte County. We could create an agency within Butte County that actually oversees that, as opposed to um, going into a partnership with a for-profit corporation. Mm -hmm. We don't have any additional questions from the audience, but I have one that I'd like to, to ask you as I've listened to you talk. Um, Project your mind forward 10, 20 years. What, what do you see that Butte County could be and what do you fear Butte County might be? What are, what are, what are some of the optimism and the pessimisms that you feel about the future yeah. of this county? Yeah. 
So I grew up in Virginia, and I grew up in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, which uh, very rural, and it's where the Civil War happened, right? Big Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. I went to, mm -hmm. you know, I went to Spotsylvania uh, or 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 um, um, Battlefield uh, Middle School. I mean, I was in the Civil War area. And it was a beautiful place to live. And there were rolling hills. And there was a lot of forest. And you know, as I grew up and as I went to college and I came back and I would go visit my mom and I would you know, leave again, I saw my hometown. It looked a lot like Butte County, very beautiful. And I saw my hometown slowly disappear with development. And I don't go anymore. My mom passed away. Um, 15 years ago, and I don't go back anymore because there's no reason to go back. It is literally shopping mall after shopping mall, strip mall, mall, housing development, all of those back roads. I mean, I can drive a mean stick shift. I grew up on the back hills of Virginia learning how to drive, and all of those curves have been straightened out for safety. I get it, but, but it is unrecognizable. So. I don't have a hometown anymore because it is absolutely gone. My concern is if we are not paying attention and the development that is coming to Butte County is not done in a way where we, dr we drive that energy, I'm, I'm concerned that we could lose it in 20 years to look back. And this happened to my hometown in a very short period of time, 10 years, it wasn't recognizable anymore. So I'm a bit concerned that in 20 years, if we are not paying attention, we could lose the very beauty of Butte County because we've developed it in a way, maybe it'll look like San Jose. Maybe it'll look like Fredericksburg, Virginia. I don't wish that on anyone. So that's what I'm concerned about. What I think would be very exciting is in 20 years, we still have the amazing viewscapes that we, do ha that we have right now, that we have um, a thriving Chico, and I think we could have a thriving Gridley. Gridley, here we are in Chico, most people don't realize, Gridley is an amazing little town. It's got amazing history. It's beautiful. I think these communities could be thriving again. Gridley, I'd love to see tourism in Gridley, have it as a destination place. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to see in 20 years we still have an intact aquifer, a healthy aquifer. I think that we could rebuild the ridge in a way that's safe, that's beautiful. Um, and I think that's possible. As long as we're planning, what I keep saying to people is, as long as we're planning and we're working together and we're not fighting among ourselves, we all want the same things. All of us, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, we all want the same things. And it's a matter of how about if we imagine the future together, as we imagine the future together, we start to trust each other. And when we can imagine the same future, then we can build that future. So, um, so a lot of it is my own personal um, exciting view of what the possibility is for Butte County. But I think also where it gets really exciting is as we imagine together, it gets better than I could have imagined on my own. So, so that's, that's what I think. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate that. Let's have a round of applause for Thanks. Sue Hildebrand, candidate in District 4. And uh, I also uh, want to, of course, uh, thank earlier in the segment, we had, uh, of course, Doug Teeter and Harry, uh, Henry Schlager joining us in District 5. Uh, so thank you to them as well. Thank you all for showing up tonight. I want to remind everyone and everyone out there as well, uh, March 3rd is the deadline to get your ballots in, uh, mail by ballot. Uh, ballot by mail, mail by ballot, mail and ballot, mail and ballot whatever, whatever the, the common terminology is. Uh, but make sure you get them in the mail by March 3rd. Um, it's primary is probably not going to be a general election, folks. So this is your chance to vote. So get out there and please get your ballots in the mail by March 3rd. Well, that was Sue Hildebrand, District 4 mm -hmm. running. You know, she's got some experience in disaster recovery from mm -hmm. her time in Katrina. And she makes a good point. There'd be a lot of money coming into the county and, yeah. and who's going to be watching? Who's going to have a watchful eye for all those special interests? Mm -hmm. uh, really liked her answer on water. Uh, she's obviously very smart on yeah. water, mm -hmm. much more than uh, I think people realize. And um, 
just going to be a good race. So, yeah. Well, you know, she studied the issues. I mean, you know, she came into this and, and she was the one that really they, a lot of people wanted her to run in this race yeah. and yeah. she stepped up and did it. And I think that she did a nice job. Uh, and she's really learned a lot, I think, and, and done a really good job of presenting herself to the, uh, the voters here in uh, District 4. Yeah. It's Important seat, yeah. a chance to flip the, the county uh, yeah. supervisor. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, a, a big race. It's a obviously the money going into that is uh, the biggest in the county, and yeah. it's been the biggest in the county that they've seen in a long time. Long time. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be an interesting race. And again, I want to just call out one more time. We said it a few times on this, these little uh, in between uh, segments we've done in and amongst this forum. Uh, vote, please vote. March third is the deadline to get your ballot in the mail. So make sure you do that. It is mail in uh, here in Butte County, so you have to make sure you do that. So get your ballot in the mail. Whoever you vote for participate in the uh, in the process and hey this this uh, this primary on March 3rd is really essentially the general in terms of deciding who's going to be the next supervisor yeah, it's a huge district. responsibility so, yeah. for voters yeah. in this area right make, now make sure you do it all right well that's our show thank you all for joining us I uh, want to let you know that we're available obviously on social media and on Facebook uh, including Facebook uh, check us out wherever you download your podcast and subscribe and like us on Facebook we, uh, we like you to like us there. That's always great for us. Uh, and also, we want to thank our sponsor of the show, David Green of Edward Jones. Uh, David Green is your local uh, Chico Edward Jones representative, and he's available uh, at 2101 Forest Avenue, Suite 120. Additional information is available at edwardjones.com. Edward Jones, making sense of investing, member SIPC. And that's our show. So thank you all for joining us. You're going to be seeing us on uh, upcoming episodes of NorCal News Now in the coming weeks and months. So we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Thanks.